wine belong in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> Imperial oppression got you down? Do you seek revenge but lack the skill to take it? Kung Fu is the answer! to fight injustice. <laughs> yeah, I'm just messing with you. Welcome to the Shaolin Temple and DVD Emporium. Largest selection this side of the Great Wall. We got it all. Action, drama, comedy. Not to mention special interests. Huh? Yeah, no, seriously, no judgments here. Got it. Not looking for that kind of adventure. Okay, let's have a look at you. Uh, I'm familiar with this. Standard revenge plot, your family lived on a farm. Maybe they were murdered. Nah, I've seen it a million times. I've got it. Your twin sister is forced to marry an evil general. Distraught, she takes her own life. But before you can avenge her, you need training. So you go to the ancient Shaolin temple to learn the secrets of the warrior monks. to the wilderness to learn kung fu from nature by fighting tigers with nunchaku tigers with nunchucks that's something you don't see every day yeah pretty ludicrous well then let's get some input from you what sort of kung fu tale do you want to tell who's your favorite kung fu director how about chang che or Jackie Chan? Nothing? Seriously? Bruce Lee! Dude, this is serious. You need the full immersion. Prepare yourself, Pilgrim. I'm about to give you all the answers. Now assume the lotus position and... Look into my eye! Today I'm gonna teach you something new. Good, Kung Fu. Once upon a time in China, families carefully guarded the ancient secrets of healing and self-defense. They passed this knowledge from generation to generation. Until a few thousand years later, someone thought it looked cool and filmed it. Okay, this guy here is Wang Fei Hong. Uh, actually, it's Quan Ta King playing Wang Fei Hong, the original and most famous kung fu hero. A lot of Chinese stars played him, but none as well or as often as Quan Ta King. Oh, check it out. Here he is in the most famous scene from The Magnificent Butcher. Translation, the man of virtue is invincible. Awesome. Okay, kung fu flicks draw from two traditions. In the East, they looked like this grainy masterpiece. 
In the West, they looked something like this. Guys like Buster Keaton were the first American kung fu stars. Think about it. They were professional daredevils who risked their necks on film. In Asia, Peking opera influenced kung fu film. In America, though, it came from rowdy vaudeville theater. Believe it or not, this is kung fu. In Chinese, the term literally means human achievement. If Gene Kelly makes this look easy, it's because he has a lifetime of practice. When martial arts found its way to America, it wasn't much of an achievement especially in the hands of the untrained James Cagney. Look at me, Ma. I'm a black belt in karate. As cool as it is to see Frank Sinatra karate chop a table, American filmmakers didn't really understand the power of Asian martial arts. Never forget your humility and kindness. Real Kung Fu is based on self-improvement, peace, and love. And Hong Kong movies always say so. Yes! For about 10 seconds in films full of bloody vengeance, Easterns and Westerns had a lot in common. America had gunslinging Clint Eastwood. Asia had sword-slinging T. Long. And in both, they knew how to use them. <laughs> Kung Fu is more than just sweet fighting, and it took a visionary to reveal its true spirit. King Hu was the first auteur of Kung Fu movies. He described the fighting in his movies as dancing. And as you can see, it is a carefully choreographed ballet of death. Meanwhile, a British hero was preparing the English-speaking world for gritty, realistic martial arts. That man's name was... Bond. James Bond. Dr. No introduced the world to secret agent 007 but it was from Russia with love that showcased the true power of martial arts. This is an awesome fight scene. It's exciting, athletic, and displays real martial arts technique. Modern movies still copy this approach. Bondo-san also introduced the world to Japan's real ultimate power. Ninjas. Top secret, Bondo-san. This is my ninja training school. The world was almost ready for serious kung fu movies, and a serious director was about to explode across Asia. World War II, Hong Kong's theaters were for women. Men worked, kids studied, and only housewives had the time to see movies. Hong Kong films reflected this sensibility. <laughs> Director Chang Che had a different vision. He wanted action, manliness, and violence. <laughs> Chang Che liked men, manly men. He created the Yang Gang, a crew of ripped, sweaty dudes who trusted each other more than any woman. He punched Kung Fu Cinema square in the hidden dragon, and he did it with one arm behind his back. 
actually with one arm behind rising star Jimmy Wang Yu's back. The one-armed swordsman was inspired by the tormented James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. You're tearing me apart! And the violent release of Bonnie and Clyde. It was a hit, making a superstar of Jimmy Wang Yu, who plunged back into action as fast as the studios could make him. But not for long. Jimmy Wang Yu got too big for Che's britches, and the two went their separate ways. <laughs> Chang Che replaced him with three men, real-life martial arts champion Chen Quan Tai, action director David Chiang, and the charismatic Ti Long. Together and separately, these guys blazed a trail for a new era of Hong Kong heroes. T Lung became a superstar with a vengeance. In a film called Vengeance. It made Chang Che the master of the massacre. But real kung fu is about balance and serenity and stuff. So Chang Che made a film about pilgrims seeking discipline at the Shaolin Temple. And getting revenge when it burned down. Hey, the dude knew what he was good at. The stars weren't safe either, going out in one blaze of glory after another. If it starts to look kind of the same, it's because Che took a quantity over quality approach, making over a hundred films in his career. Chang Che was constantly on the lookout for new meat. Thus was born the five deadly venoms. Guo Chui, a.k.a. Philip Kwok Choi, a Taiwanese opera master of light skills. His opera buddy, Chang Sheng. A Hong Kong muscle man named Lo Mang. The leg fighter, Sun Qian. And villain, Lu Feng. Separately, they were great. Together, they were dynamite. Punch. The Venoms were Che's last team, but his final great martial arts flick is definitely Five Elements Ninjas. I mean, it had everything. Muscle men in capes. Loads of action. and buckets of blood. But Chang Che's rule was over, ended by the kung fu star the whole world knows. In America, Bruce Lee is synonymous with kung fu. But the legend had humble beginnings in Hollywood, with guest starring roles on Raymond Burr's show Ironside. and a part in the movie Marlowe, starring James Garner. Bruce finally got the chance to really show what he was all about in this episode of Long Street. Now, I want you to feel the difference when I put my body behind a kick. When I count to three, exhale strongly. I'll be kicking you. OK. One, a two, a three. Hey, hey, hey. But nothing was so important as his role in the Green Hornet. Not yet. But even at maximum speed, that van can't possibly get away from us. The series was canceled after one season, but Bruce was preparing to headline his own show. It was called simply Kung Fu. 
It was a TV series about a Shaolin monk wandering America's Old West, and who better than an already established Chinese master of Kung Fu to play a wandering Chinese master of Kung Fu? It's time to play The Casting Couch! We need a Kung Fu monk to wander the Old West and throw people around like toys. The network wants muscle, the producers want an actual Kung Fu master. Who will you choose? Good compromise! The show turned out pretty well. It introduced millions of Americans to the ancient art of Kung Fu, but it was clear David Carradine was no Bruce Lee. Bruce decided to take his skill where people would appreciate his revolutionary brand of action, Hong Kong. In China, Bruce was already a star. They called the Green Hornet the Kato Show. He teamed with veteran director Lo Wei, and they took off to Thailand with a makeshift script called The Big Boss. Lo Wei wanted Lee to battle hordes of villains in elaborate fight scenes, but Bruce insisted on using as few moves as possible, earning him the nickname Three Kick Bruce. <laughs> Producer Raymond Chow agreed. Bruce Lee was about to revolutionize kung fu movies. Overnight, he was a superstar. Whatever Bruce Lee wanted, Bruce Lee got. Hey, who's gonna say no to that guy? His second film, Fist of Fury, was even better. More power behind the camera meant more power on camera. Bruce finally confronted the discrimination that had been plaguing the Chinese since World War II. <laughs> and kicked it to shreds. That scene turned Bruce into the Chinese Elvis. He was the Kung Fu King, baby. <laughs> He was so effortlessly awesome that he took the most unwieldy martial arts weapon and made it deadly. I mean, it's two sticks chained together, and he makes it look beautiful. Vista Fury was a huge success, and in the end, it was Hollywood that finally came to Bruce. Enter the Dragon is Bruce Lee's most famous film. Shi Qian, famous as the villain in many Wong Fei Hong films, played the evil Mr. Han. Angela Mao played Bruce's sister. But Bruce Lee was Enter the Dragon. His kung fu was magic. It didn't matter whether the dialogue was weird. Man, you come right out of a comic book. The plot strained credibility. What do you know about Han? Han's only contact with the outside world is this tournament, which he holds every three years. Or the acting was stiff. I see your talents have gone beyond the mere physical level. Everything the film lacked only served to make Bruce look better. <laughs> Oh. Ah. Producer Fred Weintraub said that Bruce gave Enter the Dragon its soul. There were no monks or Shaolin legend in the movie until Bruce put them there. Creatively revitalized, Bruce Lee leapt into new projects and launched the first film he totally controlled, elevating kung fu film to a whole new level. Way of the Dragon showcased Bruce Lee's wit as well as his fists, but some of that humor is lost in the English dub. The fact 
that Bruce and the villains don't understand each other is central to the plot, a point which is lost when everyone is dubbed in English. I'm crazy! <laughs> But humor isn't the only reason this movie is famous. Way of the Dragon is the Bruce Lee versus Chuck Norris movie. <laughs> this fight launched Chuck's career and an internet meme that just won't die. But it's classic for more than the meeting of two titans. In addition to his modern choreography, Bruce added an artistic flair previously unseen in kung fu film. Oh, and he totally kicked Chuck Norris's ass. <laughs> Time. Way of the Dragon was a huge hit in Bruce Crazy Hong Kong, but Enter the Dragon was still not ready for release. So Bruce started work on... Game of Death. The title was tragically prophetic. Bruce filmed more than 40 minutes featuring Daniel Inosanto, Ji Han Jae, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It was meant to be a knockdown, drag out kung fu quest movie. One battle after another, featuring masters of different deadly styles. Sadly, it wasn't to be. On July 20th, 1973, at the age of 32, Bruce Lee was dead. The cause of death was announced as an allergic reaction to a prescription medication. It was a tragedy that many found difficult to accept. Bruce was a legend in his own time, and his mysterious death only increased his myth. That was bad enough, but what happened next was worse. Instead of honoring Bruce's memory by faithfully finishing his story, the studio manufactured an abomination with ineffective stand-ins and ludicrous camera tricks. Seriously? So you got in here Really? Your patience. That's not you gotta be done. kidding. It wasn't over either. Game of Death set the stage for an era of Bruce exploitation. You. Schlockmeisters all over Hong Kong started grinding out copycat flicks starring Bruce Lai, Bruce Lei, and anyone else who looked Chinese and called themselves Bruce. Greedy filmmakers counted on English audiences to not notice or not care. It was a terrible insult to the memory of a man who spent his life fighting prejudice and advancing the art of kung fu. Fortunately, Bruce Lee's legacy transcends any film. His charisma and philosophy inspired millions and continues today. While Bruce was out conquering the world, back in Hong Kong, there was a man conquering the art of kung fu film. This old school badass never took an English name. His name was Lu Chao Liang. Master Lu got his start as a choreographer and had a hand and fist in many Chang Che movies. In 1975, he debuted his directorial skills with a slick little supernatural kung fu flick. The spiritual boxer was a surprise hit, but not exactly what audiences still grieving Bruce Lee were looking for. Lu Chao Liang needed his next film to hit big. It did. Master Lu convinced the studio to tell the story of young Wang Fei Hong and his Sifu, the ultimate tale of the student-teacher relationship. 
Challenge of the Masters was more than a hit. It introduced the world to Master Lu's adoptive brother, Lu Chahui, a.k.a. Gordon Lu. An accountant until Master Lu brought him into the film business, Gordon Lu had a unique and earnest look. And killer kung fu. <clears throat> Master Lu followed his sophomore success with Executioners from Shaolin. Hmm. The film tells the story of Hung Gar, the Lu family style, and introduces one of Kung Fu cinema's deadliest villains. Pai Mei was the famous betrayer of the Shaolin Temple, and actor Lo Lie brought a special bloody charisma to the role. And balls. Really, really strong balls. Executioners from Shaolin is a classic revenge movie, but Lu Chaoliang is probably most famous for. <laughs> Standard revenge plot leads Gordon Liu to the Shaolin Temple to learn Kung Fu. So begins the greatest training sequence ever filmed. <laughs> Training pays off big time. He invents the tri staff and kicks a lot of ass. <laughs> Liu Chaoliang's contribution to Kung Fu cinema is way too big for just one sitting. So I'm gonna give you some highlights. The ultimate Mantis style movie, Shaolin Mantis. A Kung Fu Kramer versus Kramer, Heroes of the East. <laughs> His class warfare epic, Dirty Ho. <laughs> the Kung Fu My Fair Lady, My Young Auntie. <laughs> and of course, Legendary Weapons of China. This movie features so many different kung fu weapons and techniques, they labeled them during the climax. In 1983, Lu Chaoliang started production on The Eight Diagram Pole Fighter, starring kung fu superstar Hu Sheng. Unfortunately, on July 7th, Fu Sheng died in a car accident. Master Lu used the footage with Fu Sheng and adapted the film to feature Gordon Lu as the central character. The whole thing ends with an insane bit where the monks decide not to kill the attackers and instead defang them. Oh, the humanity. Liu Chaoliang's career is a cornucopia of cool. He knew and loved Kung Fu, and his work is not to be missed. Kung Fu doesn't have to be serious. In fact, one star made a career of falling down. Bruce Lee gave birth to Jackie Chan by killing him. See that dude getting his neck broken by Bruce Lee? That's Jackie. Ouch. That's him too. But Jackie had to climb a long way before he was allowed to fall. He spent 10 grueling years in a Peking opera school, training to become the nimble badass we all know and love. When he was ready, Jackie started doing stunt work in the world of Hong Kong cinema. He got his ass kicked in dozens of Chop Saki films until finally, he got his big break. The death of Bruce Lee. 
every young martial artist wanted to be the next Bruce Lee, except Jackie Chan. Even though Jackie was chosen by director Lo Wei to step into Bruce's shoes, his heart wasn't in it. Why imitate when you can innovate? In Drunken Master, Jackie played a young, mischievous, and totally hammered Wong Fei Hong. It was a brilliant combination of silly comedy and serious kung fu that ignited Jackie mania. Before long, Jackie had total creative control over his films, and like his idol, Buster Keaton, he would take hours, days, months, or even years to get exactly what he wanted. But Jackie's newfound power came with a price. This sequence from Dragon Lord took a whopping 2,900 takes. If Jackie's obsession sent budgets soaring, it was totally worth it. He dragged kung fu films kicking and screaming into the 20th century. Set in 1903, Project A revolutionized the kung fu film in two ways. First, with a daring and dangerous new look for the action. He added dust to give it a cool visual effect. And for the first time, showed stuntmen actually hitting the ground. Finally, Project A was highlighted by an extended chase sequence that would have done Buster Keaton proud. It climaxed with this fall. No wires, no padding. This guy is out of his mind. And he did it three times. Project A was unlike anything Kung Fu film audience had seen before. But Jackie wasn't through with them yet. Police Story is one of the most copied films in action movie history. This scene was borrowed by Michael Bay. And this one by Sly Stallone. There's a good reason for that. Jackie Chan's police story is one of the best action movies ever made by anyone, anywhere. Jackie's mix of emotion, comedy, and incredible action set the standard for years to come. It also has a mind-blowing sequence shot in a real shopping mall. And since they were only allowed to film during the hours it was closed, nothing, not even the escalators, were padded. Of course, Jackie saved the most dangerous stunt for himself. He slides three stories down a light fixture while light bulbs explode around it. Sweet! The crew inadvertently upped the wattage, so all the skin on his hands melted off. As painful as his mistakes were, Jackie knew how exciting the behind-the-scenes footage would be and started putting outtakes over the credits. Jackie Chan was at the top of his game and at the height of his powers. But the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Armor of God is Jackie Chan's Raiders of the Lost Ark. Filming started great. And though he got this scene right the first time, he wanted to go again. The branch broke and Jackie cracked his skull open, nearly killing him. If anyone can bounce back from an injury like that, it's Jackie Chan. He recovered and finished the film, though he still has a hole in his head covered in plastic. His injury on Armor of God seemed to affect his feelings on fighting. Now he would find ways to avoid finishing off an opponent, choosing to literally dump them off screen instead. But more than anything else, Jackie wanted to be seen as a great filmmaker and set out to prove his awesomeness behind the camera. Jackie wanted to remake Pocketful of Miracles, originally written by Damon Runyon. The film's alternate titles reflected the mash of genres it became. 
Sometimes it's called Canton Godfather. Sometimes it's called Mr. Canton and Lady Rose. But mostly it's known as Miracle. Because with all its musical numbers, silly comedy, gigantic sets, complicated camera work, and incredible fights, it's a miracle the damn thing worked. Jackie's reputation with his Hong Kong audience was secure. He wanted to immortalize his kung fu on film by showing it at its best. Hey, stop! And who better to help him? The titanic team-up of the Master of Martial Arts movies and the Clown Prince of Kung Fu film started out great. But as filming went on, things got a little complicated. Master Liu wanted Jackie to fight as many adversaries as possible, but Jackie wanted things to be more personal. There was only one thing to do. Jackie took over the filming, leading to one of the greatest extended finale fights in kung fu film history. It starts with a battle Master Liu directed and ends with Jackie's masterpiece. Thinking it might be his final full-on kung fu film, Jackie gave it his all, creating some of his most complex moves. Culminating in an intense one-on-one -on -one with his longtime friend and ex-bodyguard, Ken Lo. But this time, Jackie Chan emerged triumphant. Without losing his sense of humor. Drunken Master 2 was a triumph and remains Jackie's final kung fu masterpiece. After decades of neglect, women were about to make a kung fu comeback. With the advent of Chang Che's Yang Gang, women wushu warriors were few and far between. What about Chang Pei Pei? She was a 60s star who caught a break with King Hu. He cemented her fame in Come Drink With Me. Her long career more recently included the villain Jade Fox in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. But the first woman to consistently lead in kung fu movies was Angela Mao. You might remember her as Bruce's sister in Enter the Dragon, but she is a fierce contender on her own, headlining movies like When Taekwondo Strikes. Retirement in the 80s left Kung Fu without a major female star. Until. At first, Jackie Chan treated women like dolls. Or punching bags. Or simply ignored them. But all that changed when he met Michelle Yeoh. For the first time ever, he gave a woman equal billing in Police Story 3, Super Cop. Some say Jackie was so challenged by her kung fu, he came up with the helicopter scene to make sure she didn't steal the film.
started as a dancer and beauty queen. Her first film, Yes, Madam, wasn't initially released. The studio didn't think audiences wanted a woman kung fu star. <laughs> Which was a shame because it also introduced Cynthia Rothrock. Notable because she succeeded in the macho world of kung fu not only as a woman, but a guai lo, foreign devil, as well. It took the success of their next film, Royal Warriors, to get Yes Madam released. Michelle and Cynthia were off in fight. Cynthia got her first full-fledged Hong Kong starring role as Blonde Fury. Michelle, meanwhile, worked and fought the cream of the kung fu crop. Perhaps she was most loved for this mind-blowing little superhero movie, Heroic Trio. But it was a familiar name that introduced her to the West. Bond. James Bond. Waylin. Even giving 007 a run for his money. <laughs> Michelle became a star the world over but still stays close to her kung fu roots. Before 1981, all mainland Chinese films were propaganda. That all changed with the Shaolin Temple. Huh? tale of, you guessed it, <laughs> revenge. It also introduced a young new talent who had already been a national kung fu champion at the tender age of 12. His name is Li Lian Jie, but you can call him Jet Li. The movie was such a hit that tons of Chinese students started cutting class to find the Shaolin Temple. A sequel was immediately planned. This time, the plot was based on Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Basically, there are seven Shaolin Kung Fu boys on one side of the river and seven Wu-Tang Sword Girls on the other. You can imagine where it goes from here. Call me later. Sitcom plot aside, the incredible Kung Fu did most of the talking. While Master Lu, Jackie, and company did screen fighting based on Wing Chun and Hungar, this was more traditional Shaolin boxing. <laughs> the huge success of the two movies left the Chinese film industry with something of a problem. They wanted the glory of their country to be appreciated internationally, but foreign audiences giggled at their old-fashioned approach. Somebody make it stop! <laughs> Master Lu came to the rescue once before, directing the Four Seasons scene in the first Shaolin Temple movie. <laughs> this time, they gave their director what he'd always wanted, dozens of highly skilled kung fu performers. Usually, Master Lu had to find actors and dancers he could train in kung fu. This time, all he had to do was set them up, tell them what he wanted, and roll the camera. The Chinese government also gave him the key to the country, allowing him to film in their most treasured spaces. The Forbidden City. The Great Wall. And of course, the Shaolin Temple itself. In addition, it gave him Jet Li, who could do anything the renowned director asked him to. With all these great performers, Master Lu designed some of the most complex kung fu ever seen. It was awesome. He even brought back one of his favorite styles, Shaolin Mantis. 
After the staggering success of the Shaolin Temple trilogy, Jet Li now had all the power he wanted. He just didn't know what to do with it. It would be years before Jet found his footing again. Without Master Liu to save him, Jet Li could only turn to one man. Ambitious director Choi Hark thought that Wong and Jet were a perfect match. And the audience agreed. Jet anchored Choi's politically charged worldview to create a crowd-pleasing hit, resurrecting Jet's career while rebooting Wong Fei Hong. In Once Upon a Time in China 2, they found a perfect balance of story, comedy, and of course, action. Jet and action choreographer Yuan Woping were a great match. Both leaned toward Tai Chi rather than Wing Chun or Hong Gar, and their sentiments and skills were well suited. Like Master Liu and Jackie Chan before him, Jet wanted to immortalize his skills at his peak and decided a remake of Fist of Fury was the way to do it. Teaming again with Yuan Woping and incorporating a politically correct view of Sino-Chinese relations, Jet made a masterpiece of martial arts. Jet did his own personal variations on Bruce's approach. See how he deals with multiple attackers? How he shows martial arts inferiority? How he contrasts Chinese and Japanese techniques? It all comes together in this stunning scene. After that, the only place to go was West. Many Asian stars tested the Hollywood waters. Jet Li dived right in. Just as in Enter the Dragon, Lethal Weapon 4's loose plot only served to showcase the Kung Fu star's skill. After making a bunch of Western action films, Jet returned to China. Hero was a masterpiece that used cinema language to its advantage. For instance, each character was differentiated by color. Jet Li's story is red. The Emperor's is blue. Tony Lung's memories are green. And white is reserved for the truth. The Kung Fu in Hero, choreographed by Tony Ching Su Tung, confirms the film's classic status. As befitting the artistry of director Zhang Yimou, each use of kung fu in the film correlates to life. The fight with Donnie Yen is compared to music. The battle alongside Maggie Chung is compared to calligraphy. The fight between Maggie and Zhang Ziyi is compared to nature. Jet Li followed Hero with a string of quality films, finally winning a Hong Kong Best Actor Award for his work in The Warlords. A full 25 years after his first film. Kung Fu Masters don't grow on trees. There just 
aren't as many old-school cradle-to-grave martial artists out there anymore. It's much easier to shove a gun into an actor's hand and say, Kung Fu this, mother... <laughs> Gun Fu was inevitable. The main reason it took so long was the Japanese law forced homegrown filmmakers to build prop guns for their movies. Plus, Chinese were proud of their Kung Fu and sword slingers. No one really took guns seriously in Kung Fu films. Except John Woo. The posters for A Better Tomorrow looked like a drama about school teachers. It was actually about firing two pistols while flying through the air. And also revenge and brotherhood and stuff. The kung fu film industry changed overnight. Everyone went gun crazy. The ticket buying public wanted more and they wanted it fast. Only one problem, John Wu didn't want to make a sequel. The producers practically had to beg him. So Wu decided to overdose the audience. Fuck you! It backfired. Audiences loved it. After years of restraint, the excess became part of the appeal. <laughs> Wu may have been trying to lampoon himself, but his overkill became his trademark. Along with doves. And Mexican standoffs. A trio of gunfu masterpieces followed. The Killer. <laughs> Bullet in the head. <laughs> and hard boiled. With the Chinese takeover of Hong Kong coming, Wu was sure that his brand of ultra-violence wouldn't be tolerated. He decided to leave Hong Kong with a bang. With hard-boiled, John Wu shot the works. Worked with ex Venom Philip Kwok Choi as co star and choreographer to create elaborate battles. Ending with a full tilt gun fu blowout in a hostage hospital that remains one of the most famous shootouts ever. John Woo hit Hollywood with 15 years of films you might have heard of. Whee! <laughs> what a predicament! Only recently did he return to both China and his roots as a kung fu director. <laughs> But he did bring one thing back from Hollywood. Pervasive special effects. always had special effects. They just weren't good special effects.
that changed when Choi Hark came back to Hong Kong after finishing film school in Texas. Yes, you've heard that name before. He brought back Wong Fei Hong. He produced John Woo's first two Gun Fu masterpieces. He even paved the way for woman wushu warriors with his groundbreaking hit Peking Opera Blues. But he may be best known for bringing Star Wars style special effects to kung fu films. <laughs> He wasn't the first to combine Kung Fu with the supernatural. <laughs> Master Liu introduced pretty much everything, but others took it and ran with it. <laughs> And the man who ran with it farthest and fastest was... <laughs> Samo's mom told him all sorts of scary stories when he was a kid. So when he grew up, he wanted to immortalize them. <laughs> Samo was also great at combining these ghosts and goblins with kick-ass kung fu. even introduced the world to the original Bloodsucker, now recognized everywhere as the Hopping Vampire. Otherwise known as Gyonshi. These Chinese vampires hopped because their joints were stiffened by rigor mortis, and usually went after their own family because they were buried with bad feng shui. Ah! Joey Hart took it to the next level with a Chinese ghost story. Joey was inspired by Sam Raimi's Evil Dead, but gave it his uniquely Eastern perspective to create a beautifully made movie about a 300-year-old tree demon with a long tongue. A really, really long tongue. Working with Tony Chin Su Tung, a Chinese ghost story took the world by storm and sucked out its insides with a tree tentacle. But naturally, Choi wasn't going to leave it at that. As special effects improved, so did his ambition, and ultimately, he knew what he had to do, remake Zoo Warriors of the Magic Mountain. The result was outrageous. <laughs> Suddenly, it didn't seem to matter how well a star could fight. There was a flood of films where computers did all the hard work. Sadly, human kung fu fell by the wayside. American films may have influenced early kung fu filmmakers, but it wasn't long before Hong Kong returned the favor. Bruce Lee was not the first kung fu star to break out in America. That honor went to a man who starred in nearly 300 films in his 40-year career, Lo Lie. America trimmed King Boxer's nasty bits. <laughs> and renamed the film Five Fingers of Death. For many, it was the first taste of Hong Kong Kung Fu. Even in the aftermath of Bruce Lee's death and the attendant Bruce exploitation, Kung Fu started to grow in America. Black Belt Theater, a syndicated package of Hong Kong Kung Fu, played all over American televisions in the 1980s. It was a steady diet of Kung Fu for a new generation of fans a generation that was watching movies instead of developing the motor skills necessary for defending themselves from bullies. 
they needed someone to guide them, to show them the secret of self-defense. Daniel-san. What? Karate here. Karate here. Karate never here. Mr. Miyagi was that man. And the Karate Kid reignited American interest in martial arts. But the Karate Kid wasn't the only game in town. Remember that hairy dude who got his ass kicked by Bruce Lee? Chuck Norris is a martial arts champ whose work with Bruce Lee and Way of the Dragon led to a busy career. With high points... ...and low. Oh yeah, that's a vampire. But Chuck's happy ending started with Lone Wolf McQuaid, where he co-starred with David Carradine. Norris is quoted as saying David Carradine is about as good a martial artist as I am an actor. Of course, Chuck Norris is now known for his own brand of Western martial arts. But there's another master of the barroom brawl. The story goes that Mike Ovitz, once one of the most powerful men in Hollywood, decided that his Aikido teacher would make a great action star. And he was right. Thus was born the career of Steven Seagal. Instead of punches, it was pretty exciting to see Seagal bend, break, and flip his opponents. Get him, man! He's doing it on the ground! He's a punch. Aikido is also cool because it can't be used until there's an attack. Seagal's best movie is Under Siege. It was Die Hard on a Boat, but it was a good Die Hard on a Boat. Seagal and Norris carried the torch in America, until Kung Fu came knocking. For years, Jackie heard that American audiences would not accept the Chinese star. Fortunately, he didn't listen. Filmed in Vancouver, standing in for New York City, Rumble in the Bronx isn't a great film, but it has Chan's great action. It was a success, hitting number one at the American box office. Director Brett Ratner knew how to capitalize on his comedic actors, and Rush Hour was a huge hit, spawning a couple of sequels and a few other Jackie as comedic kung fu co-star films. Watch out! So big Hong Kong stars were making inroads in America. But what about A-list American stars? Who among Hollywood's elite was brave enough, strong enough, and excellent enough to attempt hardcore kung fu? I know kung fu. The Matrix cannot be underestimated. It introduced American audiences to the high-flying wire work that had long been a staple of Hong Kong wuxia, Chinese superhero films. And paved the way for Hong Kong film to invade American theaters. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon proves that American audiences aren't as close-minded as critics would have you believe. It's subtitled, has no Americans, and a female lead. Four Oscars and more than $100 million says Americans like foreign film, so long as it has kung fu. But what made the movie such a success was Ang Lee. He linked the sword slinger's superpowers to their own emotion, something that clearly resonated across countries and cultures. To put it simply, the tragic lovers' bodies were doing what their hearts could not.
it could have been the dawn of a new era for the kung fu film. Sadly, American distributors didn't take the hint. Movies like Hero and House of Flying Daggers were delayed, dismissed, altered, and mismarketed. Maybe the only close-minded people in the theater are the ones holding the keys. The turn of the century was a rough time for kung fu films. The Japanese economy, where so many producers found funding, tanked. Hong Kong, once independent, was returned to Chinese government control, and the movie industry had to contend with its many rules. Freedom shrunk, unemployment grew. With all these problems, all one superstar could do was laugh. The hilarious Stephen Chow started as a Hong Kong Pee Wee Herman by hosting a children's television show. But he soon realized he'd need to make his own luck. First, by borrowing the luck of God of Gamblers. All for the Winner was one of those rare spoofs that made more money than the film it was spoofing. <laughs> Stephen Chow was off and running and never looked back. Whether the subject was Chinese mythology, <laughs> legend, <sighs> cuisine, Stephen Chow could laugh at it. <laughs> but he reserved a special place for Kung Fu. With Shaolin soccer, he brought them all together. Shaolin soccer introduced the English-speaking world to Chow's brand of hilarity that was miraculously balanced with an ability to make the audience care about his characters, no matter how crazy things were around them. Shaolin Soccer ended with Stephen Chow's vision of a kung fu utopia. His next film was the highest grossing movie in Hong Kong history. Kung Fu Hustle was an homage to all the movies Chow saw as a kid. Remember the mime scene in Way of the Dragon? <laughs> it's little wonder that the Chinese audiences loved the movie, but incredibly, English-speaking audiences did too. Chow didn't skimp on the action. He mixed the choreography of two masters, Sammo Hung's hard-hitting brawls. <laughs> and Yuan Woping's mystical duels. And finally, it explodes into full-scale wuxia. Yeah! Stephen Chow is the king of modern kung fu comedy. This is Donnie Yen, son of renowned Tai Chi master Bao Sim Mak. Naturally gifted, Donnie went to train with the Chinese Olympic wushu team, but left when he was discovered by Yuan Woping. But the timing sucked. Donnie broke into films just as Hong Kong films were breaking out from under him. Coming to Donnie Yen's rescue, as he had for so many others, was Wang Fei Hong. Although Donnie wasn't playing the Confucian healer, he was playing the man trying and failing to kill him. Donnie made an even greater impact in his following films. He played another villain meeting an unforgettable fate in Chui Hark's Dragon Inn. Put the cover. Ah! Ah! Made a spectacular show in Butterfly and Sword with Michelle Young. Ah! Oh, straight through him. But he achieved superstardom in Yuan Woping's next classic, the beloved Iron Monkey. This was Donnie Yen's Wong Fei Hong movie, 
only he wasn't playing Wong Fei Hong. He was playing Wong Fei Hong's father. Iron Monkey is considered the greatest wire work kung fu film. While most fans hate wires because they rob kung fu of its balance, Yuan Wuping created just the right mix of wire assisted stunts and gravity based action. After that, Donnie was truly on his way. As more and more kung fu filmmakers went to America, Donnie stayed in China to become the new king of kung fu. He is in demand now more than ever. Teaming with director Wilson Yip, he has made some of the best kung fu films of the 21st century. Donnie had even more freedom than ever before, and he used it to advance kung fu choreography, integrating mixed martial art ground fighting. Soon, Donnie Yen and Wilson Yip got the balance of drama and action right. If you want to be seen as a perfect hero, the best idea is to play a perfect hero. Donnie found his icon in Yip Man, famed for being Bruce Lee's real-life Wing Chun teacher. By playing the honored Sifu, Donnie found a shortcut to maturity and serenity. It was a perfect vehicle for Donnie. He could show Yip Man's wisdom without diminishing his power. Ip Man won Best Picture in 2009 at the Hong Kong Film Awards. To top it off, Donnie Yen received his first nomination for Best Actor. But who could possibly follow that? The answer may be this mild-mannered fellow, Jackie Wu Jing. Yuan Wuping discovered Wu Jing at Wushu University and put him on Chinese television, where he made one of the most successful shows in Kung Fu history. Tai Chi Master showcased Jackie Wu Jing's innocent charm and impeccable Kung Fu. But he found an opportunity to play against type in Donnie Yen's SPL. You'll barely recognize him in this knife fight. I don't blame you. It's ridiculous. Hong Kong Kung Fu is in good hands. Chinese government film regulations continue to grow, forcing modern Kung Fu films into the past. This gave rise to a new kind of action choreography, Battlefield Fu. John Woo's Red Cliff exemplified this new trend. But as Asian cinema retreated into war, American cinema advanced into peace. Fittingly, it was the unlikeliest warrior who showed the way. Kung Fu Panda caused the Chinese government to reprimand their own film industry for not doing it first. The universe has brought us the Dragon Warrior. What? Unlike other films, Kung Fu Panda was unafraid to show Kung Fu in its complex glory. It also understood what Kung Fu is, using your opponent's aggression against him. Oh, you know this whole... Real-life Kung Fu masters always geek out during the climax where Po says the magic words. I figured it out. Skadoosh. Now that's Kung Fu. So what is the secret to martial arts? Listen to the panda grasshopper. There is no secret ingredient.
Hey, it's that Pigman from before. Out of the way, Pigman. Oh no, haven't you learned anything? Kung Fu cannot be learned in just a few years. I've made up my mind. I have to learn. When you learn Kung Fu, then you'll know not to make those mistakes. Kung Fu films will keep doing what they do best. Seek peace and self-improvement? Sure, but mostly fighting. <laughs> Pulling out a dragon. 